good morning everyone uh, we are just waiting for some people to get in and then we'll start in a few minutes dr Agarwal, Agarwal, it's already here so we'll wait a few minutes good morning everybody welcome dr Agarwal, and thanks for your lecture today Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, today we have the pleasure to have Dr. Arjun Agarwal with us. Uh, Dr. Agarwal, uh, our chief, uh, Dr. Juan Bay, is right now in surgery. He will try to get in as fast as he can finish his surgery. We have here our 
cornea and glaucoma chiefs, uh, Dr. Miguel Angel Lopez and the Dr. Margarita Arbaje with us. We have many attendings from the hospital also. Most of the residents, some of them are in the hospital working. And we have residents from Peru, uh, Israel, Mexico, and some other people watching from YouTube channel. Uh, today is an honor to have you here. Dr. Ashwin Agarwal is the chief of clinical service at Dr. Agarwal's group I hospital and their clinical board chair. He's also a cataract corneal refractive and anterior segment rec reconstruction surgeon. Uh, it's an honor doctor to, to have you here. Thank you very much. Hernan, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I think um, it's times like these that we all need to come together more than any others. And uh, first up, uh, I wanted to congratulate all of you guys for you know pulling off. I'm seeing all your many webinars that you guys have been doing and it's just phenomenal the kind of educational content that you guys are putting forth. So uh, before I start, I wanted to say stay safe, stay uh, healthy. Uh, at this in this grave times and with so much of uncertainty at least the certainty that we will all come out of this a little bit more educated a little bit more learned from something that we saw during the whole uh, crisis the global sadness and the crisis that we are seeing right now uh, having said that i think uh, Arnan, if uh, uh, if you don't mind i'll start my uh, talk yes yes doctor go ahead Okay, so uh, the, the two big topics that I want to talk about today is mastering the glued IOL procedure and a single pass four through pupilloplasty procedure. Uh, these two procedures, why these two and why, why is it so important to get both of them together in one uh, setting is uh, important to understand. We'll go through that with uh, case scenarios during my procedures. But in case you guys don't understand something or if I'm going too fast or the video snags in your uh, in your interface for some reason or the other, uh, I've put up my, uh, I'm reachable at any of these sites and you can just ping in and I'll gladly be able to help anybody and everybody on that front. So don't, uh, I'll keep saying this on and again, wherever you need help, you can always ping in and reach out to me. I'm ha very happy to help anybody during this whole, uh, at any point. Uh, without any further ado, I'll start my topic first up being mastering glued IOL procedure. Uh, hoping you guys are also recording this for some safekeeping at some other point later on. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Please tell me if something is going wrong or not playing or anything like that. All right. Sorry, I have to come out of this for one minute. This down. Yes. Okay. Can I? Can you see my screen? Yes, doctor. We can see it. Okay. So I want to take you through a glue dial workshop, and I think a workshop is important because it, I'm going to break this down, this procedure or the surgical steps involved in this procedure. So first up, we have to understand why do we do it? Uh, any case of posterior capsular rupture zonular dialysis, subluxated lenses, progressive conditions, uh, nucleus drop, IOL drop, and an endothelial keratoplasty. And these are the predominantly the most important indications. I'm sure that there'll be something that uh, would add up to this at some point. Let's dig the, deep into the surgical procedure. And I've broken this down into step by step. The first step is conjunctival peritomy and cautery. So first up, what I'm doing is uh, doing a conjunctival peritomy at three and nine o'clock position, which is my ideal site if I get a white to white of tw uh, 12 millimeters or below. Anything above that, I would change to a vertical glue dial and hence my conjunctival peritomy and cautery would be at 12 and six o'clock position. But most more common than not, I always, always tend to do a three and nine o'clock position for my conjunctival peritomy and cautery. 
Next up, I'm using a flap marker. Or it's also called the blue dial flap marker from Epsilon Company. I have no financial interest in that uh, product or the this thing. Uh, so here, this is the product. Basically, it marks the sclera. And I'll show you. This is exactly how the product looks, and what it does is basically marks the sclera once you put some ink on it, and that helps me demarcate the flaps 180 degrees apart. I make my flaps 2.5 by 2.5, but nowadays I've started to go to two by two millimeters flap. The reason I do two by two, I'll explain soon. So how do I make this flap? And I think this is one question, even though it sounds very simple, but I think it's a question that has been asked to me many times on the podium uh, whenever I'm giving this talk. And I just thought it's important to discuss this. I make three partial thickness grooves and then go at the base of that. And that's exactly how I even make my trabeculectomy flaps. Watch again, I go all the way in and all the way out. It's simple, it's easy, and it's very effective. Instead of doing the old trabeculectomy method where I'm taking a uh, knife and cutting one by one, that gives me a very jaggered uh, flap base, which is something I don't like. And this is very fast and quick. So that's one way I make the flap. The next up, I have to push some infusion. Remember guys, never ever put viscoelastic inside the eye whenever you have a vitreous in the anterior chamber. You must always implant or infuse a infusion cannula that helps give integrity to the eyeball. So what I'm doing here is placing a trocar through the sclera. That is, watch, I'm at the limbal point. I'm not going into the posterior, I'm going into the anterior. This is much more comfortable for an anterior segment surgeon to do this rather than go in the posterior. But should you be more comfortable in the posterior segment, please go ahead and you can also install a, a posterior trocar. And that's a call the surgeon needs to take. Next up, once I have that infusion, you can always do a posterior or anterior as per your choice. Next up, I'm making my sclerotomies. Now, what is a sclerotomy? It is a uh, entry that I'm making into the vitreal cavity, but I'm making it through the flap, under the flap, 0.75 to a millimeter behind the uh, blue limbus. So watch this again. I'm using a 22. Now I've gone to a 23 gauge also sometimes. And watch what I'm doing. I'm making a, a, a entry, sclerotomy entry, behind the iris. So the direction of the needle should not be flat, it should be very perpendicular and it should be towards the center of the globe or even to the macula. So if you direct your needle to the macula and then go in, you'll always go in the right direction rather than direct your needle to the center of the pupil. Do not direct your needle to the center of the pupil. Just to see this again, I'm directing it to the center of the globe. And that's how we make this entry. Next up, I'm making my uh, main my, my main port and my side port entries through the clear corneal wounds, which is what I need for manipulation of the intraocular lengths, which will come next, which is IOL loading, which is very important. Just watch this. Make sure that all the haptics are in. The haptic does not turn like this in the cartridge. If it does, please make sure to straighten it out. Why? Now people ask me, why do you straighten it out? The reason I straighten it out is because I want to have a lucky seventh sign. A lucky seventh sign gives me an easy indication that I will be able to grab and safeguard my haptic or slash IOL inside the eye, even if it doesn't snap. So what happens if you leave that bend, it will snap out and there are chances of the IOL fully dropping inside and behind. So let's watch this. How does the lucky seventh sign help? Here's my lucky seven sign. I go in with my left hand, IOL grabbing forceps. And now I can easily just grab that IOL haptic and then inject or implant that intraocular lens behind the iris. Again, remember this, I'm doing it behind the iris, making sure that the haptic now is externalized while I'm injecting. Now, there are two choices here. You can have a plunger mechanism of uh, in IOL which is what you have in the Alcons and the Bosch and Lons. Or you can have the j, &J lenses, uh, which is a sensor, which is what I'm using in this case, where you have a rotating uh, mechanism. Now, in case you have a rotating mechanism, you will need an assistant beside you to actually help you rotate that 
apply that injector. Next, what I'm trying to do here is get my second haptic out. Now I've got one haptic out. How do I get the second haptic out? First up, straighten it out. When you straighten it out, the IOL flattens. Next, push it inside and handshake it to the other hand. Now go through the sclerotomy and again grab the tip. Do not grab the flange of the haptic. Grab the tip of the haptic and externalize it. It, 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 is sim it looks as simple. Initially, maybe a little difficult to maneuver both the hands in and out. But believe me, it's easier than a cataract surgery once you get the hang of this and any other suturing methods that you have thought of or done in your past. And one more thing is very important. Please keep the questions flowing in the chat box or the this thing because it's very important. Read, even if it's the YouTube channel or the Zoom channel, please keep the questions flowing. We, I would love to answer each and every question of yours with the time that I have been given with, by her. So anyways, here is a Gebor Shariat's tunnel. Gebor Shariat is a surgeon from Germany uh, who actually helped me understand this tunnel. And this is how it's basically made with a 26 gauge needle parallel to the haptic. As you go along parallel to the haptic, watch this first haptic goes in very easily because I'm a right hander. But the second haptic will be little challenging here. If you pull like this, it will go direct upwards. So what my trick is, to hold it in the side fashion, where if you push it back, it now directs itself into the plane. And this is a small trick, but it's so useful when it goes down to the wire, when you actually are trying to tuck that second haptic in place. Next, the IOL is in place. I don't have anything more to do with this. Now, all I need to do is close that flap with glue. And I close both my flap and conjunctiva with glue. And this is pretty much the end of the case after, of course, removing the trocar, whichever anterior or posterior that you have placed, I remove the trocar. Some tips and tricks. If you are having a large cornea, more than 12 millimeters, please go for a vertical glued IOL instead of a horizontal. Do not make a large flap. The minute you make a large flap, see the tuck that you get is very less. And that tuck is something that you don't want to see. Uh, coming out. You don't want it slipping back in. And that's why you want to have a longer tuck. This is probably the worst complication somebody can have. And the way to uh, avoid it is this. Uh, this is a, uh, when you have the wrong direction in your uh, sclerotomy, you can have an iris root bleed. So what I would suggest is go in direct vertical approach towards when you're going down. Once you have passed all the resistance, then change the direction of the needle and make it go horizontal. Don't go horizontal and then vertical. It doesn't make sense. This is a very important trick. And this is also bringing me to the point of why single pass four throw pupilloplasty is important. Optic capture can happen post-operatively because you do not have the anterior rexus margin rim, which is available in a normal cataract surgery. The optic of the IOL over here can get caught up in the iris like this. And this can happen post-operatively. If it happens on table, it's easy to fix. But if it happens post-operatively, there's no fix to it. And hence, it's better to do a pupiloplasty. And I'll talk about that pupiloplasty very soon. So don't worry about that. This is one of the main reasons why pupiloplasty is very important. <clears throat> Thank you. But I will continue my topic. And I would love to see a few questions before I go ahead. How do you measure post-operative centration of the IOL with this technique? So very good question. And I'll take that question and move on because I don't want you guys to miss out. I have many videos. I don't want you guys to miss out on the videos. So I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Yes, doctor. Oh. We're hearing you clearly. Okay. So the question uh, that, I, that has been asked is, uh, how do you measure the post-operative centration? Centration is not post-operative. It is purely intraoperative and you can measure it, not just measure it. You can even tighter it. Let's say you got the centration off a little bit. All you have to do is release the haptic on one side and tuck more on the other side. Okay. 
do you do an anterior vitrectomy yes of course 300% i do an anterior vitrectomy and that's one of the reasons uh, i put infusion inside the eye before i even do anything inside the eye infusion anterior vitrectomy yes of course i missed to show you guys that because i thought the procedure is self explanatory but yes 300% please do an anterior vitrectomy in all these cases i'm going to move on to my next procedure which is the single pass fourth row and subsequently any further questions you have will also keep coming in but i have many videos that shows the reasons of why we are doing both and what's the advantage and so on and so forth i hope you guys can see my single pass fourth row so let's understand this procedure here i have no financial interest in this as well in single pass fourth row let's understand what is the reason we are doing it we are trying to cover a pupillary defect it could be a coloboma it could be a trauma it could be an iatrogen whatever be the cause now there is a proximal iris and a distal iris then in the distal side i make a stab distal incision again only distal side i have made an in distal incision proximal side has a proximal incision that is made by the ninoproline suture then i use a proximal iris i go through that through the distal incision i make a 26 gauge entry into the distal iris it could look confusing i want you guys to watch it on my youtube channel if you are confused but what i'm doing is railroading that whole ninoproline suture outside now let's break this down and understand this suture trail because this is very confusing if you watch it on a 2d screen like this part 1 of this is external to proximal incision part 2 is in proximal incision to proximal iris part 3 is proximal iris to prox uh, to the distal iris then is distal iris to distal incision distal incision to the external these are five parts why is this important because i now take a loop i take a loop from the second part and bring it out of my distal incision remember i take a loop from my second part and bring it out of my sec distal incision cut part 5 and throw part 5 into loop 2 i hope this is clear and i know this might not be if you are confused or you are watching this for the first time next i just pull part 1 and part 5 apart at the minute i pull them apart they form a helical pattern that helps me bind that iris knot structure into place and make sure that that whole complex is now settled down this is basically the procedure now i take a micro scissor and chop off the excess sutures that might be there make sure that the suture is flat and not sticking up because that could lead to endothelial touch applications where do i use this single pass fourth row I use it in pupillary defect, in urethral zavalia, appositional angle closure, any high astigmatism. Why I'll tell you later. Intrascleral haptic fixation, pseudophagic bullus. What is pseudophagic bullus, and how do I use this over here? Look at this case. How does a single pass for? So how does pupilloplasty help in this case? I know I have to do a endothelial transplant here. I have made my glued iol markers. most common condition why this happens pseudophagic bullous keratopathy is because of some vitreous involvement in the anterior chamber so if you see this as soon as i went in i could see a thickened desmet membrane which i had which was attached to the iris i pulled it out and i saw and i understood very clearly that that io or the intraocular lens inside was dangling in nature and there was vitreous all around it So what I have to do now is ensure that that three piece. Luckily for me, that was a three piece lens inside. What I have done is basically externalize those haptics and now compartmentalize the eye. Once I do that, if I do a pupilloplasty, if I don't do a pupilloplasty, this air which I need for my endothelial transplant will go down. So now that whole defect over there needs to be closed so my air can be present post operatively. i hope i'm getting you if you have any questions please put them forward i would love to take them question by question i'm not going to talk about the procedure here basically i'm doing a pupilloplasty here with my single pass fourth row pupilloplasty choice that's my choice now when i do a air bubble that graft will stick into place watch what i'm doing now i'm taking off the uh, the desmets and the endothelium making my 
pre-dismiss graft. Once I've made my pre-dismiss graft, putting it into place, ensuring that the bubble stays is only because of the single pass fourth row. Otherwise, that bubble was going down. This is pre-operative and this is post-operative of the same patient where ideally anybody else who I would have sent this to probably would have done a optic, uh, optical penetrating keratoplasty. Going ahead, but before that, I thought it's important to take some questions on these two procedures. There's uh, a there's a question, doctor, from the from the other technique. How mm -hmm. long is the learning curve curve in the glue IOL technique? Okay, so it depends on where you're learning it. I mean, in our uh, institute, I think we have a probable rate of. Uh, 10 to 15 cases, if you get under the right uh, technique, uh, right person who's teaching you, I think 10, 15 cases and you'll get the hang of it. You'll be able to go back. Yes, there is a need for you to be a uh, at least an intermediate surgeon, one, and you need to have probably done anterior vitrectomy at some point. Those are two prerequisites, I would say. Nice. The, another question is, do you help yourself with working images to evaluate, evaluate the situation? Fantastic question. I think that play comes into that that helps me in single pass fourth row, but not in the uh, IOL. In the glued IOL, it does not help me. In single pass fourth row, that's a very important play because I use in high astigmatism to make that pupil size as small as two millimeters or even lower. And that's where the Perkinji fiber uh, Perkinji image number one uh, becomes very important. So going ahead, let me move ahead and we'll keep getting some more questions in. Doctor, there is another question uh, from our YouTube channel. Uh, we have in charge, uh, Julio Navarrete is our academy in charge of resident. He's from sure. Ecuador. He will be right now asking the question. Sure. What's the question? I just want to thank you for an amazing lecture. Um, from YouTube, Cyclops is asking, Dr. Ashwin, what is the suture and needle that you use for pupiloplasty? The suture is a 9-0 polypropylene suture. And the needle is a 26-gauge needle. You can go even smaller. You can go up to a 28, uh, 29 or 30 gauge. But I find 26 as well does the same job. Now, there is an option here. If you can, without piercing the iris, you can pierce with the ninoproline. This way, you reduce the size of the hole that is made on the iris with the 26 gauge needle. Doctor, one, one more question. When you use the four plus velocity uh, for angle closure, you, you don't remove the, the lens, are you? No, I'll show you that. Uh, so good question you asked. I will take you to that direct one where it's not basically. So I'll show you in a Urit Zavalia, which kind of explains both. In this particular case, I hope my screen is visible and playing. Okay. Yes, it's working. Okay, so here is a Urit Zavalia syndrome where basically you have done an opt uh, optical penetrating keratoplasty and the iris now suddenly starts getting attached like a PAS, a peripheral anterior sinicae. Look at this OCT image. Okay, the complete PAS is formed around that button. Now, this is something that helps increase the IOP, not helps. I think it increases the intraocular pressure and that is, a, that is what we call as Urit Zavalia syndrome where the PAS forms. Now, what do you do in these cases? These are fixed dilated pupils. So what we used to do, replace the button. That's not the answer. The answer is basically here, where you're trying to take that iris tissue, first release it from the angles, release all the iris tissue from all around, do a pupiloplasty, not just one, probably three. I'm just going to forward this in interest of time because I want people to see the other videos as well. I'm doing a pupiloplasty. Nothing else. I am only doing a pupiloplasty purely with infusion inside the eye. Just so that the, uh, the viscoelastic is less and this blood can get washed off. Sometimes they do bleed. They do have these uh, issues. You can use micro scissors, go inside and chop off those 
uh, excess sutures. In interest of time, I'm just going to show you. I'm doing a second pass there. I'm doing a second pass, and I did a third pass as well. Here's the second. Again, endo illuminator. The light you're seeing there is an endo illuminator that helps me visualize through a hazy cornea. So any time I get a hazy cornea, I'm always going to have an endo illuminator inside. So infusion, endo illuminator, and pupilloplasty. Now watch that pupil size come down. Are you guys seeing this? Because you saw the pre-operative, and now you're seeing this post-operative. I want you to see this because it's very important that we see how this plays along. Close all the wounds, put some air in, and that's pretty much the end of this case right now. But how does this play out? The patient had pre-operative 40 mm, and this is now 10 mm post-operative, one week. And the cornea is clear. See, watch what's happening. The bigger point is cornea is getting clear. No drops. Patient is no drops, 12, 13 mm. With 624 vision, if vision improves, the cornea gets clear, angles open up. So many of the advantages that we used to always dream about and we can actually do this. Again, it may not work in all cases, but if we have a chance to even show 50% of the cases where it can work, I think it has huge potential for such situations. And before we proceed, I'm going to show you some more cases which can help you understand the advantages of blue dial. I'm going to show you a case. Yeah. Okay. So this was a case with Sommering ring. I'm going to pause. I have to share my screen again. Sorry. I hope my screen is clear. It's playing. Okay. So this was a case and came to me with the sombering ring. But what's the sombering ring is not something I can just avoid. I can't just leave it alone. I have to go and attack it because it's right in the center. But first, let me make my flaps in place. Once I have made my flaps using my marker, I've now pushed in a trocar AC maintainer. A trocar AC maintainer now pushed in, gives me infusion inside the eye. I'm making my sclerotomies again behind the uh, flap. Once I've made my sclerotomies, I've ensured that I'm doing an anterior vitrectomy. Doing an anterior vitrectomy, some pieces start to fall because this is a hard sommering ring. So these pieces start to fall. Some of them don't fall. I can chew them up. But there is an intention for that piece to go down south. Now, can you avoid more of these pieces falling down is a question. I will have to go back and get that. But before that, let me place an intraocular lens inside. But here, my intraocular lens intention is not to place it after I remove the pieces. It's basically done so I can place it to ensure no more pieces go inside. I hope you're understanding. I'm creating a form of a scaffold or I'm creating a support structure that helps me take out these pieces. Now I've done my glued IOL. I've tucked my haptics in place. I'm now using iris hooks to ensure I can visualize that sombering ring. Once I'm able to visualize the sombering ring, bring these sombering ring pieces into the anterior chamber and emulsify them. There's no better technique to remove sombering ring than emulsification with a phaco probe. You can try with the vitrector. You will go on for 45 minutes and only take out a small piece. So again, take it into the anterior chamber and emulsify it. It's fast. It's quick. Within three to four seconds, you're done with that. There are pieces in the posterior chamber and I will go get them again. So those are situations I will handle later, but I don't have to take out big chunks and big pieces from my posterior segment is my big question here. And some of the pieces can be burped out. I'm doing a PVD induction here. If you see, I'm doing a PVD induction to ensure that I've cleared up all the vitreous cavity. Once all the pieces are out, of this sombering ring. My lens is already into place. I really don't have to do much. If you can see the blue haptics, they're tucked very nicely into the blue, uh, into the Gabor Shadiat's tunnel. I place my glue in place, the pupils rounder, and I'm pretty much done with this uh, case. I wanted to show you some of the post-op day three images of the same patient. 
and with that i'll stop the share and i will take a few questions if there are or else i have more cases to show you guys yeah. Yes, doctor. We have a question on YouTube uh, regarding the iris suture reconstruction. Um, yes. With uh, endothelial keratoplast, do you prefer doing it doing them separately, or do you prefer doing them in a, in one in one surgery? I think that's a great question. So, I I always recommend that uh, do it in two separate stages, but it also depends on the compliance of the patient. If the patient is somebody who's compliant and is willing to come back again and again then I would suggest you can do stage one and stage two. Uh, but uh, some very few patients of mine are not compliant. And in those cases, I do it in one shot. And I call them as four in one. So I do do uh, that as well. I hope that answers the question. But yes, stage one and stage two is better. The reason why stage one and stage two is better is because in the stage, whenever you're doing a pupiloplasty, there is a fear and risk of bleeding. And that bleeding can cause a little bit of uh, uh, problem for the endothelial cells. And that's not something that is ideal for corneal surgeons to absorb. So it's always better to do a glued IOL and single pass forth of pupiloplasty in one, that is stage one. And the second stage you do your uh, endothelial uh, transplant. What Thank is the name of the instrument you use to mark the sclerotomy? I, I don't mark the sclerotomy as such. I mark the flaps. So the flap marker is called the glued IOL flap marker. I mean, Epsilon has very kindly gone ahead and named it Ashwin Agarwal uh, flap marker, but I think you just call it a glued IOL flap marker. They'll give it to you. They'll be very happy to. Uh, Epsilon is the company which this thing. I have no financial interest with them uh, in any which way. I will move on with another case scenario which is, I think, by far the uh, most important in, in, uh, in glue dial. And then I'll show you some cases of single pass as well, because I think there's a keen interest in learning single pass. So when you have a case of uh, ACIOL inside the eye, this patient came to me seven years back with uh, uh, implanted seven years back, 636 vision, and specular count was dropping by, the, by six, every six months. It was 1,300 when I was doing this case. So I knew that I had to uh, right now take a pre pre uh, preventive action and take out that uh, ACIOL. So the only way to replace that ACIOL was to do a glued IOL. I made my flaps. I've made my scleral tunnel, which is what I like to do in these cases. I don't like to make corneal wounds in these uh, wherever I can. May put my troca. Here I'm using a posterior troca because I don't know how this ACIOL was, will uh, react. And oh, wait and watch what happens. I'm doing my anterior vitrectomy behind through the sclerotomy. I can always do it through another trocar, but I didn't need to. I made my entry. Now I'm trying to release. First of all, we have to analyze the situation and see, because it's seven years old, there's always going to be some amount of fibrosis somewhere or the other. So what I'm trying to do is first see if this is actually released on all sides. And it wasn't. If you see here, there was a thick, fibrosis around that AC IOL haptic. So what I'm doing is using a second hand, I'm trying to see if I can release that with the cutter. And it was so tight and close knit to that uh, haptic. It was not, I was not able to get a, a spot to actually release that fibrosis. The only approach then finally, uh, after about 30, 40 minutes into the case, I was not able to get that out. And finally, what you probably sometimes have to do is snap that. You really have to take a scissor, pair of scissors and actually go ahead and snap that haptic because that's the only way you'll get it out. Now you can release that, ensure that the angles, now this is not enough. The angles also must be freed. Once the angles are freed, you're able to pull this whole ACIOL outside and you can watch this coming out now. Once the ACIOL is out, you, have, you can't just let go. You have to go back and get that second haptic which is cut. So that also could be stuck and snagged. The minute you snap, there's a chance of an iridodialysis, which is the worst complication you can have in these explantation of ACIOLs. And be careful, it's always better to leave ACIOLs. This is an old one. So I'm sure people who use this would probably know more about this. But ACIOL once removed, you're freeing up that whole anterior chamber, 
Now you go ahead and do some more anterior vitrectomy. Place a glue dial. I'm not going to show you the glue dial because I think people have seen enough and more of it. Uh, once the haptics are removed, you can tuck it, glue it, and probably this saved this patient's vision for another at least 10 years, if not more, because you have now put the intraocular lens back in its position that is behind the iris tissue, behind the iris. And that is an important share of information that I wanted to share. Uh, before I share my next case, I wanted to see if there are any questions. Yes, you doctor. Want. Yes, doctor. We have some questions uh, sure. coming from YouTube. Sure. Kuti Ayu is asking, can I suture the scleral flap if I don't have fibrin glue in, fibrin glue in my hospital? Most, most definitely you should. There is absolutely no harm in suturing the flaps. Instead, I would go ahead and say one more level uh, up. If you're doing this, and I've done this in pediatric patients as well, not just the flaps, in pediatric patients and high myopes, I even go ahead and suture the sclerotomy. So under the flap, there is a sclerotomy. Sometimes in pediatric patients, the scleral rigidity is not so strong. And that's why you want to also go ahead and suture that uh, sclerotomy because if by chance it starts to leak, then it starts acting like a trabeculectomy wound and you don't want that. So you probably go ahead and suture that if you find that there is a leak, if you've made that sclerotomy larger. But yes, please go ahead and suture. There's no harm in it. And I know that glue is expensive. It's not easy to find in some countries. And you can't pull five patients of this at one time, which is what actually you need when you are opening a bottle of a glue. And I wanted to ask you, um, what is your experience on tissular glue? Glue taken from the, on tissular, tissular glue, glue taken from the patient's blood. Yeah. Uh, I haven't personally used it. I use the one from Baxter. Uh, and there is one another Indian company that makes it, but yeah, I, we've only used uh, this thing. All right. Uh, Thank you. Do you think square flaps are better than triangular? Uh, in these scenarios, I would definitely recommend a, a, a square flap and not the triangular one because you don't know where the sclerotomy ends. Uh, but I think if you try it out, I'm sure, Audrey, that you can go ahead and try a triangular flap. But remember one thing. You must get the sclerotomy right and the sizing right. And also that the Gebor Shariat's tunnel is very important where you make that tunnel. That tunnel is, is the critical factor. Sclerotomy is important. The, the tunnel, the Gebor Shariat's tunnel is important. For removal of sombering ring, how do you place IOL to help scaffold if anterior posterior capsules are fibrosed? So you take, an, take a cutter and cut through the you just need a central three millimeter zone or a central two millimeter zone to push that intraocular lens IOL haptic behind. Other than that, you believe me, you don't need anything. So you just break open a, an area where you find an easy opening of the uh, of the anterior posterior capsule. If even if they are fibrosed, don't worry about it. You don't need the bag. You don't need the capsule. You don't need any of it. You're anyways trying to take it off from the central zone. If that answers my question, I will show you a case if when I find it of PHPV, but that we'll show you later. I'll move on to, uh, I showed you the urid zavalia of the SFT. I've shown you the pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. I'll show you a traumatic case, which really explains why in trauma situations, this can really be a big boon of learning single pass for through. Look at this case. I wanted to see this case. This patient came to me from Iraq and was a knifing injury. Uh, and there was a corneal tear, primary surgery done, lens, everything came off in the first instance. So all I was left with some iris tissue that was attached inferiorly at that corneal wound and superiorly towards the uh, temporal side over here. And let's see what I had to do in this case. First up, I'm going and ensuring that there is nothing in the vitreous cavity. Everything is... Is it playing for you guys? Okay, I'm going to continue. Can you guys hear me? So what I'm doing first up is making yes, my... Maps. I'm making my sclerotomies. Now push out any iris tissue. I only need the two millimeter. Look at what I said before. I just need two to three millimeters in the central zone to ensure 
that I have grabbed the haptics, brought it out. So I'm doing my glute intraocular lens or the intraskeletal haptic fixation using the gluteal technique. Gebal Shadiat's tunnel, tuck these haptics into place. Once they are tucked in, now I'm free to do the iris repair. Now this iris repair is not just any iris repair. I can't just do uh, SFT or a single pass go through. Here I have to do a combination. So the combination I'm using here is a hang back, double arm, ninoproline, pass through one side, pass the second arm again, railroad out through a scleral ridge. And when you get a loop inside, what's the loop? The loop actually you can tie it outside, make sure that that knot gets buried into that scleral ridge. This is not done yet. I need to do another one below inferiorly so I can help use that counter traction. The reason pupiloplasty works is because I need counter traction. Now I'm doing my single pass four through pupiloplasty to ensure I close all the optics. I am not doing my penetrating keratoplasty right now. I'm not interested in doing that right now because this patient came to me only for four days. I need to ensure that the IOL goes into place and then anybody can do the uh, corneal transplant on top of this. This is my second single pass four throw. Look at that. My heart was in my mouth when I was doing this. It's a really challenging case. And then go back inside. Probably this also had a macular hole. So we had to do an epiretinal membrane. This was done by my retina colleague, of course. And in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, avoid showing this part, but it's basically an inverted flap and we placed it into the macula. This was the end of the case. I want to show you the post-operative picture of this. Uh, after finishing all three procedures in one, the post-operative of this patient after gluing everything into place, this is day three. This is day three of the same patient. Uh, and I thought that was an interesting way of in introducing why the combination of all of these procedures help us so much more in today's world. Um, if, I, if we have more questions, I'll take them or I'll continue furthermore. We do want to keep some time for questions. We have 15, 20 minutes more, but uh, I'm happy to show some more cases should that be the call of the need of the hour. Yes, Dr. There's another question coming from YouTube. Salim, Salim wants to know, what's your preferred secondary IOL on pediatric patient? And he puts the case of a four-year-old with corneal tear, repair, and a fakia. Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Yes, Salim wants to know, What's your preferred secondary IOL on, on a pediatric patient? And he adds the case of a four-year-old with corneal tear, <clears throat> sorry, corneal tear repair and a fakia. Okay, so first up, I will do the corneal tear repair. Okay, if, if need be, uh, if I could, I would do it in all in one sitting. I would not change from one sitting to the other. I would do all together. And my I have not done a single case other than glue dial for the past eight years. And every single patient, whether it be a young uh, three-year-old to a, a old, uh, actually, in fact, not even three, I would say six months old. And I'll show you a case where I did one of PHPV, which uh, was, uh, which has become, uh, the glue dial procedure has become my standard go-to procedure for any of these trouble scenarios, because it gives me the luxury of placing an intraocular lens and the visual clarity of the glue dial, mind you, is probably even better than uh, the one of any other procedure. The reason being, it gives me the uh, luxury of uh, making mistakes. The error, margin for error is a lot more. Even if I go off-centered a little bit with the haptics here and there, or my flap is missing, I can always tuck one more and tuck one less. So my margin of error is a lot more, and it gives me the stability. It's always going to be a gold standard when it comes to in the secondary IOL uh, problems, uh, because there's no suture, it's fixed to the IOL, it's fixed to the eye. Whenever the head moves, the IOL and eye move together, there's no dangling which happens in case of sutures. If you have a suture fixed, uh, suture fixated IOL, it'll always dangle. And that's why the visual clarity of these patients are not very good. So my Procedure of choice, for, even for a one-year-old, would be a glue dial in case of no uh, bag. Thank you, Doctor. Doctor, we have another question from the chat. Uh, do you use other techniques of IOL scleral fixation, like Yamani, for example? 
I have tried the Yamani and I think it yeah. works exceptionally well. But my only issue is in in our in my country we don't get the IOL which is suited for that procedure. The IOL that is suited for that for that Yamani procedure is the Zeiss uh, CT Lucia six o three, which is not available in India right now because of backlog issues from the US. I think they they're using all that from the US, and that's something that uh, we don't have access to. That so unless that I get that IOL, I've tried it with these. uh sensors and the alcons and the softball but they just don't work they either too brittle they bend and there's there's a memory loss and the kinking in that case can lead to a instability of the iol itself or a tilting of the iol which does not happen in glued iol because in glued iol even if you do get a kink at the tip of that haptic you are always putting it into the gebaud chariot tunnel and whenever you do it into the gebaud chariot tunnel you will remember that it will straighten the iol completely out all over again so your margin for error is again reduced so is is very high in glued iol i'm going to show you another case where i really feel that it helped me a lot to do this procedure both i wouldn't say just one but both of them together and i think this would explain a lot through video than words so if you can see my screen again i'm going to play this patient came to me with a uh, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy and uh, iol with a dilated pupil and was not uh, it was not getting better it was getting worse uh, if you see here i'm making my flaps again this is my go to and i know it looks repetitive but it's such an important step i'm making my flaps i'm also making going to make sure that i have some uh have a scleral wound here i'm using my glued iol flap marker to ensure i can follow the tract and I actually just get a simple 2 by 2 mm flap partial thickness scleral flap made the video gets better now there's a scleral wound that i'm creating here now if you see this i'm trying to remove this thickened epithelium but it's coming out in a piecemeal format and i know that this cornea probably will not last that uh, for long so i know that i probably have to do an optical penetrating keratoplasty an opk now i'm making my sclerotomies now watch there's a hazy cornea here even through a hazy cornea i like to do things closed globe i do not like to open sky maneuvers i don't like open sky maneuvers because i faced expulsion before and if anybody in this audience has faced expulsion before will know what i'm talking about we don't like expulsive hemorrhage and that happens much more when you have an open sky especially in these complex complicated scenarios so what i'm trying to do here is basically making my sclerotomies ensuring that after doing an anterior vitrectomy making sure that the iol is now brought into the anterior chamber into the anterior chamber now using anti now some more vitrectomy ensuring that there is no vitreous that i am tracting along with me no traction cause uh, causing movements open up my scleral wound i am not opening the clear corneal wound because i don't want to go anywhere close to the cornea right now ensuring that that iol is now brought out in a circumferential manner again some more vitrectomy go in with my glued iol forceps this believe me you cannot do in a yamane or any other procedure except the glued iol you know i've tried all of them because the visualization required here is very less you only need to see let, let's see this again only need to see the tip of this blue haptic and the tip of that glued iol uh, forceps the minute you see the tip of the haptic and the tip of that all you need to do is grab and pull once you have the haptic out i'm not using an assistant this is all me look at my second hand is there's no assistant here again tip of the haptic tip of the forceps out that's it i know my iol is right now in place i close all my wounds ensure that i get my gebor chariot tunnel in place tuck that haptic once my haptic is tucked then i know i'm fully secure the glue in the whole glued iol procedure is a misnomer that you feel that that's what holds it in place it doesn't now even through this hazy cornea i can do a single pass fourth row which would be very difficult if i do any other pupiloplasty procedure 
So what I'm doing is everything is done outside. Four throws are done outside. And now I brought that pupil down in size on one side. That's not enough. I have to also go back and cut that excess sutures. And I'm doing a second single pass four throw to ensure that my pupil size drops down in size. Let's say tomorrow I had to do a uh, endothelial transplant, a DSEC or a DMEC or a PDEC in this case. I can easily do it because my pupil is round and down in size. But in this case, because the cornea was not so good, I had to use a trephine button and I had to make sure that I get my trephination right uh, to do an optical penetrating keratoplasty. I'm in interest of time, I'm going to avoid showing the sutures. Uh, I don't think I have many, but here's the only time I have an open sky, just 20, 30 seconds, that's it. There is no other time that I have given for myself of having an open sky position and that avoids my complication of having any expulsive hemorrhage. And this is my four in one. I have explanted an intraocular lens, done an anterior vitrectomy, implanted a glued IOL, done a single pass fourth row, and done my optical penetrating keratoplasty all in one sitting. The reason I showed this is because this has become my go-to way of doing any combination procedures as well. I know a lot of times people ask me, uh, so I would take a call based on case to case, whether to do all four in one or three and one. So I could split it, but that's how I would like to uh, explain these procedures, these difficult scenarios. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. There is a question coming from YouTube regarding the IOL power calculation on the patients you glued. Perfect. So all glued oil procedures are behind the iris. They're exactly like how I place them in the bag. I don't change anything in my IOL power calculation, exactly like how I would do an in the bag. So if you tend to go more myopic, if you're going to go to a 0.5 myopic, please go ahead and do that myopic. Nothing changes. The IOL power stays the same. Only thing, remember, it has to be a three-piece uh, lens. Do you prefer C-loop or J-loop? Uh, only C-loop, three-piece uh, IOLs. My order of choice would be probably uh, J and J uh, and Zeiss, uh, CT Lucia, those two lenses on top, and then would be the Bosch and Lomb soft core, and then would be the Alcon. Alcon is very brittle; the haptics break very easily, and that's why I don't like them for this procedure. And uh, I'm going to move ahead with one more video. There's one more from the same doctor. Dr. Yeah, Dr. yeah, Bunch. sure, go ahead. Sure, How go do ahead. you manage if there is a buttonhole on the square of lap? Buttonhole, you mean to say buttonhole or tear of the flap? Both are possible. Buttonhole, I've not seen too much, but what can happen is you probably can have thin flaps. You can have thick flaps. In both the scenarios, just change the position. Go a little more oblique. Simple. Paste those back. In case I have had even a tear of the flap, sometimes the flap just tears out. And in those scenarios, don't worry. Do the whole procedure. Bring the haptics out, tuck them in, and glue them back. Glue that flap back in place. Don't worry. Keep it in a Petri dish on the side. And glue it back in place when you're done with the case. Don't worry about it. It's as simple as that. And if you do, uh, if you, you won't get a buttonhole as, as, as such because you're going deep. You might get a deep uh, flap. If in case you get a deep flap, ensure that you close it black and just change the position, make it a little more superficial. Don't use that flap if it's deep because then you have a chance of leak. I hope that answers the question. Can you? Yes, doctor. Okay, I'm going to show you one more case, unless there are more questions. If there are more questions, I'll take them. But if not, I'm going to go ahead and show you one more case. Perfect. Okay, so this happened actually very recently. Some questions that were asked to me was, um, what if my glued IOL or if I have a uh, lens that is on, on the retina? So this patient, actually, I had done glued IL about six, seven years back. And after uh, 
uh, after a few uh, this thing this was when we were when i was learning glue dial and i thought this is very important that we can have this complication at times and if you see here i've done a pupilloplasty as well two pupilloplasty is done but the length of that what was a mistake i made over here in that at that period of time was i didn't understand the distance between the uh white to white the white to white in this case specifically was more than 12 mm so whenever you have more than 12 mm i would like to go vertical can you see my mouse i would like to go vertical because i didn't go vertical this lens dislodged and it was on the retina so what do you do now i have made oblique flaps i have not made my flaps at 3 and 9 so whenever you go oblique you're reducing the anterior posterior uh, the white white to white and ensuring that you can easily bring those haptics out now watch what i'm doing i'm making my sclerotomies here under the flaps again making my sclerotomies under the flap once i'm done with that i'm using an endo eliminator to show you guys that the sft was done earlier in the previous surgery itself So I'm not going to open up anything. I think that three uh, millimeter, four millimeter is more than enough for me to go ahead and uh, explant an intraocular lens from the retina. Uh, and this is already a vitreoctomized eye, but anyways, I'm putting a trocar and I'm going with my light to ensure that I can see the IOL, the macula, and the. If this patient did not have great vision to start off with, anyways, but I'm basically releasing that. uh what one of the tricks that i use nowadays not nowadays i actually published this in 2014 was an ecal this what i'm using is an extrusion cannula technique so i'm not using any forceps anymore for any iol lifting i use an ecal technique which basically means that i'm using an extrusion cannula extrusion cannula is a device that is used for retinal detachment surgeries where you go and drain the subretinal fluid only thing what i have done in this is i have removed that internal silicon sleeve which was there and i just go on top of the iol and press and that's it and this is my go to movement of choice for any dropped iol once i have that iol in my hand i bring out the haptic i use a by manual handshake technique of going from one hand to the other going through the sclerotomy ensuring that one haptic is out same lens i have not explanted anything i am not going to i don't want to i don't intend to now again using a handshake technique hand one by one i'm handing over one to the other and ensuring that i hold the haptic tip and ensure that i can come out once both my haptics are out in place look at the amount of tuck i get because i've just moving from a 3 to 9 to an oblique position and ensuring that there is nothing else in the vitreous cavity i'm ensuring now my gebor shariat tunnels are made and my haptics are tucked into place again now if you hold this haptic again i wanted to show you this if you hold the haptic perpendicular or parallel it will go up so hold it perpendicular push back it will direct itself down and go into the gebor shariat tunnel and that's Um, as i told you earlier any time i find that there is a leak or anything like that i always like to suture up that sclerotomy that also secures my haptic in place in case i have any fear of it dropping down and since in this case in the previous surgery we did not do that uh, suturing i just thought it's a good technique to kind of have safety before uh, story now putting my glue in place and i have pretty much closed this case up i don't need any more uh, and the iol is back in its place there's no i have not made any uh, clear corneal wounds except for those two small paracentesis and this is pretty much the end of the case i just wanted to show this because complications do happen and how do you handle it how you come out of it how do you manage if there's a button hole okay we already answered that any other questions guys There is one question. Uh, in a specific case, why not vertical scleroplaps at twelve and six? Okay, uh, a good a good question. I am more used to an oblique rather than a vertical one. 
but uh, when i say vertical you can go vertical or oblique it's it's up to a surgeon's choice but yeah you can definitely go 6 or 9 my reason of going oblique is because i get that headrest for me that headrest really helps me in terms of maneuvering and that's about it but you can go vertical and if you're more a temporal i'm not a temporal surgeon i'm a more superior surgeon so that's why i like to prefer this but if you are comfortable doing temporal surgery is absolutely please feel free instead i would say start learning the vertical glue dial it's always helpful there's one more that it's which forceps do you use to grab the haptics and number of choice for iol for this procedure procedure number one choice for iol okay number one choice of iol i'll tell you very simple i use the sensor uh, uh, sensor technus jnj platform uh, but and i have not used the other one but people tell me that uh, the uh, zeiss ct lucia 603 which has the pvdf haptic are the best because they are indestructible the haptics and so that's but i haven't used it so i for me still it's going to be jnj's uh, sensor and technus platforms the uh, second question is which forceps do you use uh, i use the epsilon's glue dial forceps but there are msts uh, micro forceps as well which you can use very comfortably for this uh, i use the epsilon's glue dial forceps because they are, they come cheap and they are easy to use and they are easy to procure also Thanks, doctor. I don't see much more questions. Well, I'm glad that I was able to show you guys all these uh, cases. There are some questions from the YouTube. Sure. When you are doing uh, your iridoplasty, your single pass for through papilloplasty, when you're touching iris, sometimes blood. Will you come? When that happen, what would you do? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. If you're doing an iridoplasty, and what happens? If if it sometimes if you for mistake or for sometimes happens, it start bleeding. Yeah. Ah, oh, million dollar question. Okay. Uh, yeah, first of all, start praying <laughs> that it stops bleeding. But uh, but so some things that we do is an infusion line. uh you can probably stop the infusion line for some time put some air in and try and tampon it uh but sometimes that doesn't no, work as well so you could probably use visco elastic at some point it slows the bleeding down and just wait uh waiting is probably sometimes really good for it to clot uh, but if it is a continuous iris root kind of bleed then there's nothing you can do you really have to just abort that case at that point of time and call in a Uh, we are surgeon but that can happen in any case uh, to be really honest yeah but not in pupilloplasty i have rarely seen it because the size of the uh, incision that you're making in the iris is very very tiny unless you're pulling or you snag some of the iris tissue from the root of the iris i don't think that happens too often There is a question coming from YouTube, Doctor. Um, do you have hands-on glued IOL cores? Yes, we do. You can just text me, and I'll tell you more about it. Thank you. And there's one that says, "Can we use Algon Grease Haber 23 gauge?" Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, please. You can any any micro forceps, vitro retinal micro forceps, which you use. Absolutely, go ahead and use them. they're very very good thank you very much doctor thank you thank you thank you all the audiences who have actually taken their time to actually view this uh, presentation i'm sure that hernan you will be telling everybody which site it will be on on your youtube page probably Yes, for sure, Doctor. There's our chief, Doctor Juan Bay, over there in the camp. How are you, sir? Doctor Agarwal. How are you, sir? Fantastic. Thank you. Lovely meeting you here. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, I greatly safe. appreciate it. And I've been safe. using the agro-wall technique for a long time. I'm so glad. I'm so happy. Very pleased to have you. My pleasure, sir. It was wonderful. And I did get quite a bit of it. And I okay. thank you for what I've done. Okay. Fantastic. I'm so glad you even came. Thank you so much. Well, Dr. Ashwin, I have no words to thank you. It's been an amazing lecture. Uh, Everybody is pleased with your lecture. So again, thank you very much. I'm, thank you. Namaste is the new hello. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> All right. Take care, Hernan. Dr. Bye, Doctor. Jiro, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, the audience. I'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Good day. Good day.